there. I'm Cindy Linden, and this is a Cook Along Podcast Quick Bite. If you listen to my podcast, you'll know that I love cookies more than almost any other thing, and that I have made more cookie recipes than probably most any other thing on my website, thecookalongpodcast.com. And we usually just go straight through the recipe, and I thought it might be useful today to talk about some tips for how to make your cookies better or how to know your cookies are as good as they can be, because sometimes following the recipe becomes a little haphazard, as I'm sure you will have heard me do, and sometimes you just want the cookies. You just want the cookies, so just put them together and make them come out and don't fuss. While that's fine and it's going to still give you the cookies that you're craving in that moment, there are some ways to make your cookies better and, in fact, consistently so. So I thought I would share some of those tips in this podcast today so that you're not just baking because the recipe says to do something, but you know the whys and what will make it betters of a recipe before you plunge in. Some of these things are kind of do-aheads for any of the cookie recipes. And sometimes I specify them that way and sometimes I don't. So this is a good chance for me to say all ingredients should be room temperature. Unfortunately, that means you have to plan ahead about making the cookies. And I know, for me at least, that often a decision to make a cookie is based on a sudden impulse, not a plan. And so I end up just grabbing things out of the fridge to satisfy the impulse. And so I haven't had time to bring ingredients to room temperature. But here's the thing. If it's a recipe where you cream the butter and sugar together, it won't work right if the butter's cold. What you're trying to do is get it fluffy. And if the butter is cold, that's really hard to accomplish. And in fact, if you do get that fluffing thing right, because your butter happens to sit out on your counter, you can ruin that whole emulsification by adding cold eggs or cold milk or cold whatever. Now, there are ways to warm things up if they're cold. You can put butter in your pockets. I do it in my microwave oven, but you really have to have a lot of practice at making sure that you know your microwave oven well enough to know what's going to happen to that butter. I've seen tips about putting a warm glass upside down over a cube of butter. I'm going to let you experiment with those things yourself, but I have been known to put butter in my pockets to warm it up faster when I really just wanted my cookies sooner rather than later. And I've also been known to put a cold egg into my cleavage. And that only works, of course, if you have a cleavage. But if you do have a cleavage, it does bring it to temperature a lot faster. If a recipe specifies creaming the butter and sugar, there's a reason for it. Creaming the butter and sugar means that you're beating that room temperature butter and sugar until they're really light and fluffy. And what you're doing with that is you're adding air. And that air in there helps the cookies expand while it's baking. On the other hand, if you go too far, the butter loses its air again and kind of liquefies. So there's no air left in the mixture and your cookies are going to come out flat. What do I mean when I say room temperature? Room temperature means that your brick of butter should feel a little cool, but if you press a fingerprint into it, you can do that without working too hard at pushing. If a recipe says that the butter should be softened, it should feel a little bit warmer than cool, and it's really easy to leave a deep fingerprint. If something says it wants soft butter, it means you can't even pick it up without it glooping back down onto the surface you've tried to pick it up from. Most cookie recipes, I think, say room temperature rather than softened or soft. So the other thing about butter is you may see often that something will say unsalted butter. And you may not have unsalted butter in the house, so you're wondering if salted butter is okay. Salted butter isn't a bad choice. Most cookies benefit from the brightness of some salt. But the reason that recipes say unsalted butter is because all salted butter is not the same. The amount of salt between brands is really inconsistent. For somebody who's creating a recipe, they don't know how much salt to tell you you should put in if you're using salted butter because they don't know what kind of butter you're using and how much sodium is in it. Hence, 
the unsalted butter. If you have salted and you want to use it, you can go ahead and do that. You will want to adjust your salt, possibly. It's kind of up to you, but it may mean that when you get to the salt part of the recipe, you don't want to use quite as much. However, don't leave the salt out. Even if you're using salted butter, you probably want to add at least a little of whatever salt is called for in the recipe because the salt really contrasts the sweetness. And without that salt, your cookies are going to seem too sweet and kind of boring. It's funny how salt, which doesn't seem like it should be a really important ingredient in something sweet, does exactly what's needed to brighten the sugar flavor and really make it, I don't know, good. It makes what a cookie is, okay? So use the salt. All right, the next thing you will have heard me say this so many times in my podcasts, measure the flour the way I've taught you to measure flour. In other words, don't scoop it. If you do that, you're going to get tough, dense, dry cookies, okay? So don't scoop your cup or whatever it is out. First, stir your flour, aerate the flour until it's nice and fluffy and it isn't just packed. And then scoop the flour into the measuring cup with the spoon and level it off at the top. That's the only way to get a decent measure. And in a cookie, my opinion is that it's a little better to have not quite enough flour than too much flour because the too much flour is just going to make your cookies tough and dry. No fun. Most cookies, not all, but most have some sort of leavening agent. That means something in there to make the cookies rise. And often that leavening agent is either baking soda or baking powder. The thing about those particular ingredients is that if they sit around your house for a long time, which most of them do because you just don't go through a can of baking powder very fast because you only need like a half a teaspoon or a quarter teaspoon at a time and you've got this whole can. It's not a bad idea if you're going to make cookies that are important to you or to the people you're making them for. You really want them to be best. You should test your leavening agent before you use it. Now, the baking soda, I think, will last a super long time, even with it being open. You know, those boxes baking soda comes in don't really even seal. So I feel like those stay really good at their job for a very long time. But if you want to test it, if you put a little in a tiny bowl and you add a little vinegar, it should fizzle. It should bubble. That lets you know that the baking soda is still going to do the job of helping the cookies rise a little bit. Baking powder, to me, is more likely to go bad because it has more ingredients in it and it is just very slow to be used. And they give you plastic lids to keep them sealed, but I think air still gets in there and I think it's not a bad idea to test that. And baking powder should bubble if you add it to hot water. Same kind of idea. Doesn't hurt to test it before you use it. There are other things that make cookies rise. And so if you see that there seems to be a large portion of these ingredients in a cookie or a brownie or a bar cookie, that kind of thing, you can guess it's going to be kind of cakey. And that would be eggs. And interestingly enough, I found this out the hard way in creating my chewy pumpkin spice bars. It took me forever to figure out that the pumpkin itself was a leavening agent. And I didn't want cakey bars. I wanted it dense and chewy. It took me a long time to figure out that and how to convert that pumpkin so I could still use it without it making the bars rise. And anyway, that's a different story. And you can find those amazingly addictive bar cookies on my website or in any of the podcast apps that you're looking for. They're called Chewy Pumpkin Spice Squares. The next thing is that when you're mixing your batter, your cookie dough, you want to mix them, and most cookie recipes will say this, mix them just until they're blended. That means you just barely get everything kind of mixed together. Don't mix it past that because if you beat it too long, it makes the dough tougher. So it really means as soon as everything's moist, stop stirring. And anything you want in chunks, like chocolate chips or fruit or something, you want to just stir those in gently at the end so that they don't get chopped up partly and broken, but also because you don't want too much beating time on it. While you're doing all those things, here's another one. You want to make sure your oven is really ready before you put those cookies in. 
What do I mean by that? It needs to be preheated and it needs to have an additional 10 to 15 minutes beyond that. Don't just stick them in when your oven beeps to say it's preheated. And if you want to know the reason for that, I'm going to send you to a blog on the website, thecookalongpodcast.com. Look for a very short, very helpful blog called Tricky Oven Temps. And I think you'll be surprised at what you find. And speaking of temperatures, the opposite of having, of course, your oven not hot enough is to having it too hot, which means you can burn your cookies. But even if your oven is the right temperature, there are things that can lead cookies to burn on the bottom. That is dark pans. I don't know why, but it's true. A dark colored pan or a thin pan can both lead to cookies that burn on the bottom. So you want nice heavy baking sheets or some of those ones that have insulation in between. It's two layers. There's a something in the middle that keeps it from getting overly hot. Or if you don't have one of those, but you want the same kind of idea, you put two cookie sheets together. They have to be stackable, doubling your pan. And parchment paper is your friend. Parchment paper is magical. I spent so much of my life not knowing the wonders of parchment paper. What a waste. Oh my gosh. Not only will they help keep the cookies from burning, but they also make the cookies so easy to get off the surface of the pan and onto a cooling rack or into your mouth or wherever they're going. Parchment paper is wonderful. You may want to consider using parchment paper even when the recipe doesn't specify that. If the recipe specifies that you need parchment paper, it means that those cookies are going to be sticky and you will be sorry if you don't use it. Silicone mats can also be great for that, but they can prevent the cookies from browning. In fact, I tried cooking some of my pumpkin butter cookies. The recipe, again, is on the website or in your podcast app collection of the Cook Along podcast recipes, pumpkin butter cookies. I tried cooking them on a silicone mat, and I kept having to put them back in for more time because every time I took them out, they were too soft. They were still gooey. And so I'd give them a few more minutes and take them out and let them cool a little bit because they finish cooking while they cool and they were still too gooey. I did that like three times and then I finally gave up. And I think it's because they wouldn't set properly on the silicone. So I'll be using parchment paper instead next time. That's just a, a caveat. I don't know that that would happen with your cookies. But if you have a choice between a silicone mat and parchment paper, you might think about the fact that it'll get a little browner with the parchment paper and silicone might not be your friend for any particular cookie recipe. Now, of course, you do want the cookies to cool before you try to move them off the cookie sheet and onto the cooling rack. Most recipes will specify that you need to let them sit for a couple of minutes because otherwise, when you try to scoop them up with a spatula to move them, they're going to fall apart. And so... At any point, if you're scooping a cookie up with a spatula to try to move it and it falls apart, it means you're trying to move them too soon. Give them a little more time to cool. And for a final note, here's a piece of trivia. If you want to know whether the recipe you're looking at is going to make crispy cookies or chewy ones, look for the amounts of sugar, fat, and flour. If the amounts of those three things are pretty much the same, pretty much one to one to one. The cookies you're about to make are going to be chewy. If the ratio is closer to two parts sugar and two parts fat to three parts of flour, they'll be crispy. Your sort of basic soft cookie with crispy edges has one part sugar to two parts fat to three parts of flour. I don't know how useful that is unless you're trying to tell what kind of cookie you're about to get on a recipe you've never tried before. But I offer that just because I thought it was interesting. All of these thoughts and ideas can be used on almost all of the cookie recipes on the Cook Along podcast website. Visiting the website is a great idea just because you can see the list of ingredients ahead of time before you listen. So you know whether you have everything on hand if you wanted to cook with me. And also has pictures of the finished product, or even the process of making whatever cookies there are so you can see what you're going to get when you're done. 
If you decide not to visit the website, you should be able to scroll back into the Cook Along podcast feed and find some of the cookie recipes that are in there. The chewy chocolate chip ones, I think, are the best I've ever had anywhere. The chewy pumpkin spice bars I've already mentioned. Uh, there are some really good other kinds of cookies in there that are well worth your time and the ingredients to put in them. Please tell your friends that you're listening to the Cook Along podcast. Tell them why you listen and tell them how they can listen so that they can join you in learning these weird and interesting things that I share and maybe bake something new for their family by cooking along with me. There'll be another Cook Along Quick Bite in two weeks and next week there'll be some new recipe I've never made before. They alternate every other week so that you can track them and they come out on Saturday mornings. Thanks for listening, and until next time, happy cooking!